Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Psych 3510. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing Chapter 6, which is on surveys and observational data, basically how we describe what people do. Uh, we're going to talk about the mechanics of different styles of surveys, um, their advantages and disadvantages. We're going to discuss um, response patterns from participants uh, and how we can write questions and write surveys in a way to get the most accurate responses from our participants and thus the most accurate data, uh, as well as data from observational studies, right? Where we're not asking the participant to provide the data in a survey, we're observing them, whether either live or over recorded video or audio, um, and then turning those recordings or those live, live observations into usable data. Uh, this lecture is a little bit on the shorter side. I think we've only got 24, 25 slides. Uh, so I think we'll make it through the whole thing in just part one. I don't think we're going to have to have uh, a part two for chapter six. Okay, so the two main sort of categories of things we're going to talk about are construct validity for surveys and polls. Basically, how can we construct surveys and polls to make sure we are measuring what we want to measure and that we are measuring things um, well and accurately. The second major thing we're going to discuss is the construct validity of behavioral observations. Basically, how can we make sure that um, data derived from observations are valid, are good, are accurate, are actually telling us um, something about the, um, the phenomena that we want to investigate. So let's dive right into survey design. First, we just need to define a couple terms. A survey or a poll is just the act of posing questions to people over the phone, in person, in uh, written format or online. It's just sort of the, the act of um, getting self-report data from someone. Now, a survey can be made up of multiple scales. Scales are typically groups of questions that try and um, sort of get a measurement of a particular construct. So you might have a 10 item scale that is part of your survey. So the survey might include demographic information like gender, um, age, race, ethnicity, you know, location, where do you live, those sorts of things, demographics. And then, a, and then the survey might have multiple scales. So we might have a 10 question scale to, to assess your depression, and then a seven question scale to assess your anxiety, and then a 12 question scale to assess your personality, something like that. So scales are the sort of the term we use when we're talking about groupings of questions that try and get data on a single construct, depression, anxiety, personality, um, uh, relationship, um, satisfaction, things like that. A survey is sort of the larger umbrella that includes, you know, anything and everything that you're asking the person. Uh, data from scales and surveys can be used to support all three of our claim types, whether those are frequency, correlational, or causal claims. We can use um, self-report survey data uh, in all three claim cases. So let's talk about the distinction between a scale and a single item. Um, let's imagine that we are interested in studying life satisfaction. Um, we could ask people, how satisfied are you with your life, right? We could just ask them this single question. How satisfied are you with your life? Um, we could do that in an open-ended way uh, where maybe they write a paragraph. Uh, we could do that on a one to seven or a one to 10 scale, right? Where they're just selecting a number that signifies their satisfaction. And so that's not necessarily bad or wrong. There's just a better way to do this rather than asking such a simple, direct, single question. What we would prefer is to develop a scale, maybe a, a, and it can be short, right? Maybe just a five item scale 
where participants either, you know, um, they read the statement and then they um, tell us where they fall along this continuum from strongly disagree to strongly agree. You've all seen these before from one to seven. And so the participant would give a one to seven score on each of these five items. And then we might add those scores together to get an aggregate scale score for life satisfaction. Um, the advantage to using a scale over a single question is that we get to probe the construct, which is life satisfaction. We get to probe the construct from sort of different angles, right? Um, so in most ways, my life is close to my ideal, um, which is very similar, but it's kind of a different question from the conditions of my life are excellent, right? Your life can be excellent um, without it being ideal. Um, and the same thing, you can be satisfied with your life with while recognizing that maybe your life is not excellent. Um, so far, I've gotten important things I want in life. Again, probing the construct of life satisfaction, but in a, in a subtly different way. Um, and so when we, when we get responses along, for example, these five items, we get a more thorough and sort of robust understanding of the construct life satisfaction than had we just answered or had them answer a single question. Um, also, using a scale can help us um, understand when participants maybe aren't um, answering or behaving in the way that we would want them to. So I want you to imagine um, that someone responded uh, with a, a seven on items one through four, which means they they strongly agree with these statements. Uh, sevens on this scale would indicate high life satisfaction. So items one through four, they answer seven each time. And then their response on item five is a two. Um, it, it's completely sort of out of left field. It, it is inconsistent with uh, their other responses. And so that might signal something strange to us about the participant. Maybe they didn't understand the question. Uh, maybe they're inconsistent in their answers. We might want to flag that. Um, we might want to follow that up with something. Um, we might want to throw them out of the study because it, it appears like their answers are sort of all over the place, right? Or especially maybe if uh, imagine that their answers are seven, two, six, one, seven, right? Then the participant is seemingly answering randomly almost. Um, things like that would are helpful with scales because we can identify situations of maybe measurement error or um, uh, participant misunderstanding. So answer all the items, we might aggregate the scores and we get a more robust understanding of the construct that we're trying to collect data on than with a simple single question. Okay, um, when we're constructing surveys and polls and scales, um, we need to keep a few things in mind. We need to keep in mind that we have to choose the question format. Um, do we want this sort of Yelp review, right? One to five stars. That's kind of basically a Likert scale type thing. Um, or do we want open-ended free response questions? Uh, do we want to constrain it even more than five or seven options? What if we only give people two or three options? Um, we have to make these decisions, and so we have to understand the consequences of those decisions. We want to make sure that we're writing well-worded questions. Um, this seems very simple, but uh, in my mind is the most difficult part of survey or scale construction. Um, I have this axiom that I like to, um, uh, to use in experimental methodology sort of investigations, and that's that humans are messy. Um, people are going to read a question and they're going to interpret it differently than the way you meant. Um, or individual A is going to in interpret the same question in a different way than individual B. People are just messy. Um, people have varying degrees of just at the very basics, linguistic capacity. So you don't want your questions to be like overly verbose or complicated. We wanna keep things simple. Um, and we only want to, for example, assess one question per question, uh, which seems simple enough. Um, 
but we can get into some problems when the questions become overly complicated, overly wordy, um, and then the, the person is sort of confused about what question they're trying to answer. And so all of this leads us to the idea that we want to encourage accurate responses from our participants. So we're gonna take each of these in turn. First, choosing a question format. Um, there are multiple question formats. These are not necessarily all of them. Uh, these are just some of the common ones that you will see in scales and surveys. Uh, first, open-ended questions, right? Um, so imagine um, a free response question like you have on an exam. Are you satisfied with your life? Or how satisfied are you with your life? Uh, please describe, right? And you get you know, 500 words or 200 words to, to respond. Uh, this is great because the participant can express themselves in their own words. It perhaps offers the opportunity for maybe a little more nuance or complexity in their answers. Uh, it allows for something that probably that approximates their subjective true feelings more accurately. Uh, but the problem is just that it, these are very subjective. You're going to get people that would answer this question in a sentence. You're going to get people that would answer this question in 500 words. You're going to get uh, people who discuss their job. You're going to get people who discuss their family. You're going to get people who discuss their hobbies. You're going to get people who discuss all three. Um, it's, it's just so open to subjectivity that sometimes um, we need to uh, sort of rein in the response uh, possibilities from our participants. Uh, furthermore, open-ended questions will require some sort of coding on the back end, right? Uh, a paragraph is not data. Um, it's just someone's words. We have to take those words and turn them into numerical data. So um, you might do something like code every time the person makes a positive statement or every time the person makes a negative statement. So they had six positive statements and two negative statements. So they get a um, life satisfaction score of plus four, right? Six positive minus two negative statements will give us a plus four positive statement, right, uh, score. Uh, you, you have to take their words and figure out some way to turn it into data, which is difficult, uh, as we'll talk about with observational studies uh, later in the lecture. Uh, our second format is called forced choice. Uh, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, you either give them the option of one or two, right? A or B, black or white, yes or no. Um, we then have Likert scales like we've seen uh, in the past. Uh, we'll talk about these in, in the upcoming slides. And then a semantic differential format, which is what you see below. Um, it's very similar to a Likert scale, uh, except that the, uh, the response options are anchored by, um, by different, um, I guess, constructs and words. So notice how um, these are not all strongly agree to strongly disagree, strongly agree to strongly disagree, strongly agree to strongly disagree, right? It, it changes based upon uh, the anchoring of the words changes based upon the question that's being asked. So maybe this was, uh, this comes from a survey about a course you took at Georgia State, right? Let's say this course. So um, from one to five, how easy versus how hard was this course, right? And then you make a selection. Uh, but then I want to know about helpfulness, right? How helpful uh, was your professor? Were they useless? One, all the way to five, very helpful. Then I want to know about clarity. How clear were the instructions? How clear uh, were the lectures? Uh, one confusing to five, crystal clear. Uh, what's going to make this semantic differential scale or format different from a Likert scale is that because the anchorings on our response options are different, um, we're not going to be able to collapse and aggregate these scores because um, what would it what would it mean um, to score a a 13 um, on these three questions? It, the the aggregate score doesn't mean anything because some points are attributed to easiness, some points are attributed to helpfulness, 
and some points are attributed to clarity. So if you were to say, well, they got a, an aggregate score of 13, you have this like, you know, um, Dr. Frankenstein amalgamation monster score of 13. It's just pieces and parts of different things put together. Um, and, and the whole 13 doesn't, doesn't mean anything more than the individual responses. So in a semantic differential format, um, to have, uh, to ensure construct validity, we generally want to not aggregate the scores and we want to keep, uh, each response separate and, and analyze it. So, okay. So the most simple, um, uh, of these formats is the forced choice, right? Uh, so let's stick with our example. Are you satisfied with your life? Um, I could condense that all the way down to yes or no, right? One, zero, black, white. Um, the great thing about this is it's very easy to understand. The data are clear. There is no ambiguity. Someone is either satisfied with their life or they are not satisfied with their life. Um, so forced choice scales, um, give us lots of clarity, but at the expense of nuance, right? This is uh, a sort of large and complicated phenomenon, life satisfaction. And people might have trouble um, adequately expressing themselves in such a format, in a forced choice scale on such a complicated issue. Now, there are other issues um, where a forced choice um, might be better, uh, and we might want to use it. Um, for example, uh, if you're studying, um, human romantic relationships or like mating behavior, uh, you might show someone a picture of an individual and say, you know, would you like to go out on a date with this person? Yes or no. Um, that's a perfectly reasonable place probably to use a forced choice scale, right? Because the, the decision of going on a date is not nearly as, um, sort of grand and amorphous as the concept of life satisfaction. So something that, that has um, a little more clear delineation and, and is a little bit more simple might be more appropriate for a forced choice scale. Next, we have uh, our Likert scales. Again, uh, the one to five anchored by things like strongly disagree to strongly agree. These are very common. And this is typically the format that we see scales take when we're going to aggregate the scores. Um, so uh, you might um, see this in any number of contexts. Uh, it's extremely common in areas like social psychology, uh, where we're asking people to report on things like their feelings or their social behaviors. Um, you're going to see a lot of these scales when we're making maybe cognitive assessments of people, um, maybe for Alzheimer's or, um, or amnesia. Uh, people are going to get sort of responses or scores uh, on six, seven, nine, ten items. And then we're going to aggregate their score. And we're going to say, um, you know, if you scored below 10, then you have severe Alzheimer's. If you score from 10 to 20, you have moderate. If you score above 20, you're mild. If you score above 30, then you show no uh, symptoms of Alzheimer's, right? Something like that uh, would be a, a really useful place for a, a, a summative uh, Likert type scale. So those are our major um, survey questionnaire scale um, format types. So free response, forced choice, uh, summated Likert scale, and um, the last one was the semantic differential format. So now we're going to uh, move forward and discuss um, how to write well-worded questions so that they're easy for people to uh, understand clearly. Uh, and to discuss well-worded questions, well, really, we're going to discuss poorly worded questions. That's the the best way to do this is to, to see examples of um, uh, of bad questions to tell us what, what not to do. So 
in general, um, we want to avoid uh, or at least pay attention to these four issues in question writing. We want to be careful not to have leading questions where um, the person writing the question is trying to sort of lead the participant down a particular path uh, toward an answer that the uh, that the experimenter wants them to have. You see this happen a lot in political polling. Um, uh, companies or individuals or, or groups that are politically motivated to sort of make people's responses look a certain way um, will write questions to try and lead people to those responses. So for example, do you agree with voter ID laws that will prevent eligible voters from casting their vote? This has um, a, a sort of political spin on it um, from a particular side. Um, it seems like a pretty simple and straightforward um, issue in question, right? We, we clearly want people who are eligible to vote to, to be able to vote. Um, but it is, it's leading you to that response, right? It's, it's not a truly neutral question. Um, the second issue are double-barreled questions. These are questions that essentially ask two questions. Um, or potentially more than that. Um, for example, do you enjoy swimming and wearing sunscreen? It's very unclear um, what this question is asking because someone could respond to this question um, towards, uh, do you enjoy swimming? Someone could respond, do you enjoy wearing sunscreen? Uh, and then someone could respond to it as, do you enjoy wearing sunscreen while you swim? Three. So there are three possible response interpretation options from this very simple and very short question. Uh, and we call it a double barreled question because there's, there's two or more barrels, right? There's two or more questions being asked. Uh, and it might be unclear to the participant which one you're asking about. Uh, and thus the data are no good because um, regardless of what the participant or how the participant responds, you know, agree to strongly disagree, whatever, one, three, five, seven, um, regardless of how they respond, you don't know what that number means anymore. You no longer know um, to which question they were responding. So the data are meaningless. Um, and in general, we want to avoid negatively worded questions. Uh, they tend to be confusing. It's very easy to have double negatives. Uh, and people are often um, poor and inaccurate at responding to them. So, for example, people who do not drive with a suspended license should never be punished. Um, one, if you disagree. Five, if you agree. Um, it's confusing about what that's even asking. Um, uh, you have to sort of do the logical mental gymnastics around the double negative. Uh, and try and figure out, is this something that I agree with or disagree with? We, we prefer much more direct, much more obvious, much more clear types of questions. And then, of course, we have to consider question order. Uh, this sort of um, um, uh, piggybacks maybe on leading questions because the, the order in which you um, give questions the previous questions might influence responses um, on the uh, following questions. So for example, if I asked you um, from a scale of one to seven, one being unhealthy and seven being extremely healthy, how healthy do you think you are? So just a general personal assessment of your overall health. Maybe you say, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not incredibly healthy. I'm not a, a, an Olympic athlete or anything, but I'm doing pretty good. Um, you know, uh, maybe I'm a, a five or a six uh, in, in the sort of health department. And then I start asking you about your behaviors. How often do you exercise? How often do you eat sweets and dessert? How often do you drink? How often do you smoke? Um, and your, your ev initial evaluation of yourself as a healthy person might impact the way that you respond to the following questions about your specific behaviors. You might be more likely to sort of uh, tweak and fudge and, and stretch your responses 
about your smoking, your drinking, your eating, your exercise in order to fit your initial evaluation of how healthy you are. So something that we might want to do in that case is reorder the questions where we ask about the behaviors first, and then we ask about the general overall uh, impression of your health um, at the end. Okay, oh, my, uh, my animation screwed up a little bit here, but we can, uh, we can just kind of play along. Um, let's investigate um, what's wrong with each of these um, questions that you might find on a survey. So one, belonging to a Greek organization increases my chances of being successful. Um, the problem here is that it's an unclear question. Uh, being successful can mean lots of things. Um, do, do you mean successful while you're in school? Do you mean successful after school? By successful, do you mean um, uh, socially successful, like having lots of friends, or do you mean professionally successful? And what does professional success even mean? Does it mean how much money you make? Does it mean how happy you are with your job? It, it's just very unclear. Um, different people are going to bring their own messy interpretations to this question, and your data are basically going to be meaningless. Next, uh, joining a fraternity or sorority will help me achieve my academic goals and meet others with similar goals. The problem here is we have a double-barreled question. We're asking two different questions. Will being in uh, Greek life help me achieve my academic goals? That's its own question. And then question two, will being in Greek life help me meet others with similar goals? Um, again, double-barreled, you don't know which question the participant is answering. Next, rushing a fraternity or sorority will help me make friends. The problem here is that we use technical language. Um, the term rushing is a very specific term uh, in the Greek life world that means to, you know, essentially try out for a fraternity or sorority. Um, but that term rushing is very idiosyncratic to the, the Greek life world. Maybe someone who's unfamiliar with Greek life, maybe someone who's a first generation college student, maybe someone who's a returning college student might not be familiar with this terminology. And so they wouldn't know how to answer this question. And lastly, uh, fraternities and sororities are for obtuse students who distinctly lack erudite qualities. Um, basically, overly confusing, verbose language. You don't need to bust out your fancy thesaurus uh, when you're writing survey questions. You need to be um, clear and clean and understandable. Right? Uh, it's sort of the old adage that uh, the newspaper is written to like a fifth grade reading level. Um, because you want as, as many people who pick up that newspaper to be able to read it and understand it. Uh, and that's kind of how we want to write survey questions as well. You might have people with varying degrees of education. You might have people with varying uh, degrees of learning disability or type of learning disability. Uh, you might have people who, for whom English is not their native language. And so the, these types of words uh, and this type of question uh, is going to be very problematic. Okay, uh, so let's look at leading questions again and just how difficult it is to deal with them. So here are two questions um, about gun control. Um, with all the gang killings and domestic disputes ending with gunfire, do you think there should be a legislation passed to limit gun ownership? Clearly a leading question that is attempting to lead the participant um, to be pro-gun control with the mention of, right, with all the gang killings and domestic disputes, don't you think we need to get guns away from people? And then the second question leads people in the other sort of political direction. Uh, the second amendment guarantees citizens the right to bear arms. Should this be compromised by legislation in the 21st century? 
clearly trying to lead people away from gun control, right? To be anti-gun control. Um, we could try to reword these questions uh, to be more neutral. Here are sort of two attempts, and they're not perfect attempts. Um, it's, it's very difficult to write a completely middle of the road, um, average neutral question about a divisive political issue. So we might say, <clears throat> do you think there should be laws to help restrict access to guns to people who are dangerous to society while maximizing ease of attaining guns for regular citizens? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, right. This is this is trying to be neutral, right? It's trying to make a distinction between uh, wanting to keep guns away from people who shouldn't have them while allowing people who are responsible to have guns. But what ends up happening in trying to, to hit that sort of neutral middle ground, uh, we end up with a very wordy and potentially confusing question. Uh, and then do you think there should be some form of legislation to help keep guns out of the hands of criminals? Um, we've taken this idea and tried to simplify it, um, but it, it's still not perfect. It's still a little bit leading, um, you know, particularly this word criminals uh, is a very emotionally charged word. Um, and it, it might influence the way that people respond. So the point here is that we want to try and avoid leading questions as best as possible, but it's really difficult, uh, particularly on divisive issues like politics. Okay. We're gonna next talk about encouraging accurate responses. Um, and in particular, we're going to discuss the shortcuts that people can use uh, that will um, produce inaccurate responses or meaningless responses. So the first uh, response set or um, response bias uh, that we're gonna talk about is acquiescence. Acquiescence is the tendency for a participant to just agree with everything. This is, you know, I go all the way over to five and I just answer everything five. Or I go all the way over to seven and I just agree, 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 all the way down. Um, this essentially creates a ceiling effect, right? Like we talked about in a previous chapter. Uh, and the data are no good. Um, you can't tell if these are the person's real responses. Uh, or if they just want to hurry the hell up and get the get the survey over with, and so they're just they're just choosing a, a pattern and going with it regardless of what the question is. So we want to avoid this at all costs. We don't want um, to see very many people with this kind of response pattern. Uh, one particular solution is to reverse code some of the items such that. Um, uh, a one would indicate agreement and a five would indicate, you know, negativity. Um, so every so often you can sort of flip the words on a couple questions uh, and you can basically try and catch a participant who's not paying attention. Um, and what is what often happens is if a particip if a participant um, is caught, uh, essentially, um, do using this response bias because they don't switch their response to the other end when it would be appropriate. Uh, you throw out the data because you can no longer tell uh, how the participant is responding. And in fact, you have some evidence that the participant is just not paying attention to the manner in which they're responding to the survey. Uh, our next response bias is central tendency. Uh, this one's pretty easy to understand. You just sit on the fence, right? You pick the middle ground and you just uh, choose the middle ground. Um, again, the same issue um, as acquiescence. Uh, we don't know um, if this person's responses are real or if, if they're just choosing this pattern and sticking with it because they, they don't want to make a commitment. Um, one thing you could do is expand the scale uh, to maybe include five items or seven items, you're still going to have a middle point. Um, so if you're really concerned about fence sitting, you could do a scale that only has that has an even number of items, right? four or six or eight. 
uh, and you essentially turn it into like a expanded forced choice paradigm, right? Where you would have like um, strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree, right? You're you're not giving them the middle ground option. They have to either agree or disagree, but then they have the added element of agree, strongly agree, or disagree, strongly disagree. Um, so if for some reason you're really worried about um, central tendency or fence sitting, uh, you can just expand the scale. Uh, and if someone really actually does this all the way down a survey, you might wanna consider not using their data uh, because you just can't tell um, what they're doing. Uh, lastly, um, there are a few other um, things we need to consider uh, to encourage accurate responses. We've discussed this previously in another chapter, um, but people will fake good or fake bad. Um, social desirability. Um, so you, you're at being asked sensitive questions and you don't want to give the true answers because they will make you look bad or feel bad. So you fake how good you are. Alternatively, um, you can get people faking bad, right? The, the trying to seem cool, like uh, imagine we're studying um, drug use in 13-year-olds in middle school and you get a kid who's like, yeah, I, I totally smoke all, all the weed and have sex with everybody all the time because I'm just so damn cool, right? Um, it, it's an it's a annoying 13-year-old boy who's trying to seem cool, um, by telling you that he does drugs and have sex, has sex, right? Um, that's that's a danger, uh, just as much as faking good uh, can be a danger. Uh, people will um, self-report more than they can know, um, as well as self-report errors in their memories of events. Um, so people, you know, expand upon things in ways that are inaccurate. Um, people will um remember things inaccurately and and will give you inaccurate data um it's uh again it goes back to my humans are messy um we we want to be careful uh, that we're not asking people to do too much in these questions uh, because people feel compelled to provide a response they're, they're sitting they're taking their time they're taking your time maybe they've been answering questions for 20 or 30 minutes um, and they feel compelled to provide responses, even if those responses are going to be inaccurate. Um, and lastly, we want to be careful when we're having people rate products. Um, this is the Yelp phenomena. Uh, people might only want to respond in extremes uh, when they are extremely happy with a product or extremely um, unhappy with a product. Okay, uh, part two um, of this first part of the lecture. And it looks like, um, yeah, we've only got like six or seven slides left. So we're just gonna finish up um, and only have one recording uh, for chapter six. So here we're gonna move into uh, observational research. Um, observational research are claims based on um, observing people's either real world behavior or observing their behavior in a laboratory setting. Uh, oftentimes in a laboratory setting, people's behavior will be recorded uh, either through audio or video or both, uh, or you can be using things like a one-way mirror as we discussed previously. So um, let's pick an example and kind of come back to it uh, over time across these slides. And the example we're gonna pick is a study that was published that put little microphones on people uh, and had them wear those microphones around and they recorded all of the audio for days and days and days um, that these people spoke as well as heard. So they were observing how much people talk. So we can see here, we have uh, an example of what this might look like. People, uh, this was published um, a number of years ago, as you can probably tell from the recording mechanism. Um, um, yeah, so this was like 
early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s. Um, <clears throat> and participants were basically given these microphones, um, 396 of them, uh, and uh, they just went about their lives. So researchers end up with these hours and hours and hours of audio tapes that have to be observed. Um, this is quite um, cumbersome because this is going to end up being a lot of information, a lot of data. You can imagine 396 people, right? Uh, even if they only wore these things for two days, right? Much less seven or 10 days. I mean, you're talking about thousands and probably tens of thousands of hours uh, of audio that someone has to listen to. Um, now, um, you might be able to have like a, an AI, like a computer program that can, that can transcribe some of this stuff that can maybe do some of the more simple tasks, like count the number of words. Uh, we can see here, the data are split from men to women. Uh, and we can see the average number of words spoken by women and the average number of words spoken by men. Um, basically pretty much similar, right? Women only spoke uh, about, what is that, 600, uh, slightly less than 600 wor more words than men per day. Um, so an AI might be able to do something simple like that, just count the number of words. But an AI is going to have trouble coding more complex issues with these data, like the emotional content uh, of the data or the scenario, right? What What is happening? Is this an argument? Is this a discussion? Uh, is this a, a, um, a conversation with a loved one? Is it a conversation with a stranger? Is it a conversation with uh, an authority figure like a boss or your teacher? Um, AI is going to have lots of trouble figuring that out. Uh, but it might be able to do this really simply. So you're going to have to train research assistants to just sit and listen to these tens of thousands of hours of audio. Um, a truly horrifying task. Um, I hope they got paid. Uh, that's all I can say. So one of the things we might want to look at from all of this data uh, are, is asking specific questions about specific events. So this paper asked a question about um, dinner time. So dinner time is, is an important time for families uh, in particular. Maybe if you are a social or developmental psychologist, these data might interest you. Um, what are the typical patterns of um, discussion and talking uh, around dinner time? So we can see here that the data have been coded um, as parents versus children, parents in the gray, children's in the black. And then we have different types of, of sort of um, talk that's happening at the dinner table. You can, ha you can have people um, showing appreciation, distaste, reward, negotiation, discussing health, uh, and then discussing pleasure. And then we can distinguish between, you know, uh, it looks like parents are more likely to ask questions about or discuss health. Parents are more likely to engage in negotiation and reward. Children are much are much more likely to express distaste, but also to express pleasure. Um, so, I mean, these give us these data give us a really interesting insight into the true reality of family conversations. Uh, this, th these are in very enlightening data uh, and might be extremely valuable for a social developmentalist. Um, these data are going to be much more preferable to survey data, to self-report. Um, you know, family time or issues in a family or the, the, the um, uh, maybe sensitive discussions that families have with each other uh, are going to be a difficult thing to gather data on because people are going to have these response biases. They want to seem good, right? Parents want to seem like good parents. You don't want to seem like a bad parent. And so if we just asked people in self-report survey about their dinnertime conversations and the content they're in, uh, it might... Um, 
it might produce inaccurate data versus um, observational uh, data like this, where we get the true essence of the conversation uh, and we can split that between parents and children. Again, uh, this is gonna be quite an endeavor to go through and listen to and you have to code, right? Okay, uh, that's a parent talking and then now it's a child talking, now it's a parent talking, now it's a child talking. And then you have to take each of those instances and categorize it as appreciation, distaste, reward, blah, 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 so on and so forth. Um, so um, again, uh, um, a mountainous task for a group of research uh, assistants. Um, and as we're gonna talk about here in just a slide or two, we're gonna have to be very careful about the way we train those research assistants because we want them all to be operating along the same set of standards. Um, the, the worst thing that can happen is that you have a group of research assistants who think they should be doing X and then a group of research assistants who think they should be doing Y and then you're combining the data and now you have no um, construct validity uh, because the data are not telling you what you think the data are telling you. So um, observations can be better than self-reports in many, many cases, but they're more difficult to do, they're time consuming, uh, but it's possible to make valid and reliable observations. We have to be careful about observer bias, where the observer um, sees what they're expecting to see. So in general, uh, the person doing the observing or doing the coding of the behavior should not be the researcher. Uh, it should not be the person in charge. It should be someone else. Um, ideally, someone else who has been trained in what to look for uh, and also doesn't understand the goal of the study. Um, ideally, you keep your observers and your coders blind to the purpose of the study. That way they cannot bias the study. Uh, it's very similar to the concept of a double blind uh, medical experiment. So if you're studying a particular medication, um, we wanna keep the participants blind to the medication. You don't know whether you got the placebo, the five milligrams or the 10 milligrams, right? Because we don't want your knowledge of uh, which medication you're getting to change your behavior. But then the doctor who's evaluating you should also be blind to which medication you were taking, the placebo, the five milligrams, the 10 milligrams. We want everyone to be blind. And then we wanna collect the data and then give it to someone who knows the research question. Uh, and then they can have an unbiased set of data. We need to be careful about observer effects um, where the, um, the participants um, confirm the observer expectations. So this is the participant sort of just going along with what the, they think the observer wants. And then reactivity which is I think the most obvious issue with observational research. Um, the participant might behave differently. They might react to being watched. Um, if you know that someone is over there in the corner um, recording your behavior, you might behave differently. If you know that there's a little microphone capturing everything you say, you might behave differently. Uh, and so this reactivity uh, is something that you have to try and manage. Um, either through something like this, where the participants do not know that they're being watched, um, or oftentimes you can have some strategies um, for getting rid of reactivity, such as uh, if I'm gonna observe, let's say a, uh, a college classroom, I might um, only begin observing or recording data uh, 10 minutes into the class, right? I give everyone 10 minutes to sort of get over the reactivity, to, to move past um, the observer being there, to maybe acclimate to the observer's presence. And then at the 10 minute mark, uh, I begin recording data, something like that. You can, you can find ways to manage reactivity. So um, a couple things we can do. 
We can make unobtrusive observations, as this woman is doing of the children. The children are unaware that they're being observed. Um, you can wait it out, like I said. You can allow participants to acclimate to your presence. Um, or you can measure the effects of behavior rather than the behaviors themselves. So you can, you can measure the outcomes uh, of the behaviors. So for example, um, maybe I'm trying to measure aggression uh, in children, uh, but instead of uh, noting aggressive behavior, uh, I make observations of how many times a child gets put in timeout, right? or how many times the teacher scolds a child. Uh, so rather than measuring aggression itself, I'm measuring the outcomes, the effects of the behavior. Um, uh, I love this picture. This is Jane Goodall. Uh, if you don't know who Jane Goodall is, she's um, one of, if not the world's most um, famous uh, primatologist. She was part of a group, I think out of Stanford. I might have that wrong. It might actually be Harvard, but I think it was Stanford. Um, back in like the 70s um, and when she was in graduate school. And there were three um, female graduate students all in this primate lab. And one of them went off to study uh, gorillas. One of them went off to study orangutans. And then one of them, Jane Goodall, went to study chimpanzees in Africa. Uh, and she has the ultimate wait it out observational research story she basically, um, you know, went to, to a particular um, preserve in Africa that has uh, populations of wild chimpanzees. And she just hung out uh, for years, um, observing them from afar. Uh, they were very cautious of her um, and collecting what data she could. Uh, and then a couple of years later, the chimpanzees began to get used to her. They began to acclimate to her. Uh, and uh, after a while, she basically became kind of part of the troop. They would approach her. They would groom her. They became very comfortable with her. Uh, she developed individual relationships with each of the chimps, uh, particularly the young ones who, who were born, who sort of always you know, knew, that, knew of life with her there. Uh, it's, it uh, was a little more difficult with the older chimps, but the younger ones especially took to her very well. Uh, and she spent decades uh, going back and forth and, and observing these uh, families of chimps across generations, such that um, they, they, you know, successive generations uh, within these troops of chimpanzees all recognized um, uh, Jane Goodall and were, were comfortable with her. Uh, and it allowed her unprecedented access to wild chimpanzees she wrote many, many books and many, many articles uh, and basically changed what we know about chimpanzees. Uh, our modern understanding of chimps uh, is in a large part due to Jane Goodall, the, the ultimate wait it out observational study. Um, once we collect the data, um, the, uh, let's, uh, this comes from our example of um, the, the audio um, uh, recordings. And when, when you have that much data and you have that much subjective data, you need to come up with a, essentially a code book or a coding plan that uh, explicitly describes how you want the data to be categorized. So for example, you might create these categories. The comment was neutral, the comment was negative, the comment was corrective or instructional, the comment was positive and specific, or the comment was positive and general. Note that these are very clear, very distinct um, types of conversations or comments that you can make. Uh, they each come with their own definition, and then they each come with examples. So this looks like it, it was um, for observations of audio coming from um, like sports encounters, sporting interactions. So a positive general comment is, are comments. These comments were defined as positive in tone and is directed at the team in general with no instructional content. Go Crusaders, nice try, good work. Positive specific, 
these comments are defined as being positive, but directed at a specific player. Nice play, JD. Uh, corrective or instructional. These comments are defined as including specific action or play the player was instructed to do. They um, are positive in nature. Go for it. You've got him. You know, you've got to cover him. Go do this. Um, and then uh, so on and so forth, right? So we can see how uh, if this was my code book, uh, I would take these distinctions with these definitions and these examples. And I would give it to my research assistants who are going to be listening to all of the audio. And I would train them to be able to correctly place particular statements into each of these categories. And then I might do some inner rater reliability statistics. If we sort of pull that back from a previous chapter, I can do some inner rater reliability correlations to make sure that my five or my 10 Research assistants are all on the same page. Uh, they're all, we, we take a, a statement and then we make sure everyone is putting that statement into the same category. We make sure that the correlations uh, amongst the raters is high uh, so that they're all on the same page. So we can see how this takes a lot of work, right? It, it, is, it goes well beyond, um, hey, listen to this audio clip and tell me what you think. Right. This is a lot of work on the part of the researcher. It's a lot of work on the part of the research assistant, uh, but it's what has to be done in order to take observate real world observations and turn them into valid, reliable, usable numeric data. Um, okay, so uh, we can also um, do things like create Likert scales uh, for uh, for ratings. So you might want to rate the emotional tone uh, of a conversation. Uh, was it from uh, one being cold and hostile, four neutral, seven warm or happy? Uh, and again, you can see that uh, inner rater reliability is the, the I ICCs. That's probably an acronym for inter something correlations. Um, Intercoder correlations is probably what that is, ICC, intercoder correlations. And we have very high correlations. And so it enables us to be confident that we are taking these subjective observational data, like a dinnertime conversation with a family, and we are effectively and validly and reliably turning it into you know, numeric Likert data or categorical data uh, split between parents and children. So we can really get a, a rich, robust uh, understanding uh, of human psychology and behavior from these observations. That's it. Uh, that's the end of chapter six. So thanks everybody for listening. Uh, and I will talk to you next time.